Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, How to Skate Through the Holidays and Keep Your Reputation Intact, brought to you by Bankable. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items I'd like to go over. Bankable offers co great content from fresh perspectives on money, career, and balance. Feel free to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and join our exclusive LinkedIn group. Links to all three are in your webinar console. At the end of the webinar, please fill out the survey. My name is Kim Horner, and I'll be your host, and I'm a social media editor here at Forbes. I have the pleasure of introducing you to our guest presenter today, Diane Gotsman. She is a national etiquette expert, speaker, television personality, author, and the owner of the Protocol School of Texas, a company specializing in executive leadership and business etiquette training. Her clients range from university students to Forbes 400 companies, and her seminars cover topics ranging from tattoos in the workplace to technology at the dinner table and the proper use of social media. She has 16 years of corporate experience and holds a master's degree in sociology with an emphasis on adult behavior. Diane's engaging disposition and her straightforward approach to daily etiquette dilemmas are current, informative, stylish, and fun. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Diane. Thank you, Kim. I'm really excited that you invited me to share my thoughts on navigating the holiday dilemmas because there are so many. That's you know, true. it's all about, and it is, and it's all about the way we handle them. Everything about us, every movement we make speaks volumes about the way that we feel about ourselves, our confidence level, the way that we conduct ourselves both socially and professionally. And in this case today, we're going to talk about all of our multiple professional situations that are going to come up over the holidays. And as you know, we are rife with social strife when it comes to questions and, and dilemmas and who do you ask? Because oftentimes we ask our grandmother or our mother or perhaps we went to a cotillion class and those are all great avenues. But now in today's world, you know, as a professional, we're in the big league. So what we're talking about today is corporate training. And the beauty of corporate training is that it puts you at ease. You know, all of these things that we experience during the holidays, we experience every day of the year because we are going to go to networking events and social functions and dining events and we have these questions and who do we ask? We might ask our grandma or our mom or our neighbor and their answers may or may not be accurate in this day and age. So that's why this is great. You know, I'm going to, before we start, I just want to start off by clarifying one thing, the word etiquette. You know, it also is, a, it is always associated with a stereotype when I meet someone for the first time. You know, if they hear that I train etiquette, they think it's cartoon classes and white gloves. <laughs> and what etiquette is, the way I train it, and what it is today, it's about mannerisms that allow you, me, all of us to feel self-confident and it's about putting others at ease so they're comfortable to be around us. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're just going to fine tune some skills that we use every day, and I call them little aha moments. So Excellent. we're going to get started. Yes. And, and the if, first if thing that listening. Oh, and if anyone listening has a question, please submit it to us, and we can be asking them, you know, during the presentation and also the Q and A portion at the end. So take it away, Diane. Yes. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about the office holiday party. And for many, it's mandatory fun. You know, and by that, what I mean is you have to go to the office party if you are climbing the corporate ladder. And whether you are at a tech company or a in an environment that is a little more uh, conservative, going and meeting your friends friends, your colleagues, your boss in an environment that is away from the office is so important. So this is the way to build relationships and let people see you outside of work so they get to know you on a different level. But there are certainly things that we need to do when we're planning for this office holiday party. So I've, I've created a little checklist to make it easy for us. And the first thing I always tell people is, you need to prepare. 
you need to know in advance, you want to know who is going to be there, because not only will your colleagues be there, but perhaps your clients will be there, and your vendors may be there, and you may only see your boss once or twice a year, so you better know who your boss is, you know, because believe it or not, sometimes you don't know who you work for if they live in a different city. You see them not very often. I have a client who told me he's a CEO of a large company. He said one of his employees actually handed him a business card. So that's the first business faux pas. You need to know who you're working for. And you don't want to show up with any surprise guests. So what that means is look at your invitation, whether it's a formal invitation, it's an inner office invitation, or it's just verbally. You know, if it just says, or if they just say to you, the party is on such and such date, so we'll see you after work. If it doesn't say and guests or plus one, no surprises. You don't want to ask them, can I bring my new girlfriend or can I bring my boyfriend or, you know, my, my kids. It's always look at the invitation so you will know what you're, what you're in for. Because it's really bad form to call the event planner or your boss and say, you know, I'd really like to bring somebody with me. Can I do it? So no surprises. And then once you get there, you need to sing for your supper. And what that means is it's your job to be interesting. Even if you are an introvert, you could be an extrovert. And by the way, an extrovert is actually at more of a disadvantage than an introvert. People usually say, oh, my gosh, they're so lucky they can talk to anyone. But generally, people that are overly boisterous, you know, leave um, a less impressive impression that someone who would be more introverted would sit back, listen, thoughtful, contemplate. So, you know, our goal is to go right down the middle. So you need to do your homework. Again, you know, look at what's in the news that's positive. Think about some conversation starters that you want to start with, and it's things like, so how long have you been with the company? Or what do you plan on doing this holiday season? Are you taking any trips? Or where have you been since I've seen you last? I know you travel often. So, again, you are thinking about things that you want to say, and you are making these introductions to people that you do not know or do not know very well if it's a big company. In other words, you don't want to get there and hang out with your cubicle mate or your roommate or your best friend from work. You need to mix and mingle and let people know you are there. I always say that you cannot be a five-star employee if you are using one-star training. And that also uh, applies to being a five-star guest because the host, is noticing what you are doing because they're nervous too. They want to make sure the party is a success, so they want to see you enjoying yourself and telling some great stories and including other people in the conversation, which means that you already know all about your neighbor that you sit next to all day long and you drove over with. So you are going to walk up to people you don't know or you don't know very well, and the first thing you're going to do is extend your hand. And that's a little etiquette tip that – you should really start incorporating. You always want to be the first person to extend your hand for a handshake. Male, female, extend first. And it's not a race. You don't want to make it obvious if they notice that you're, you're too aggressive. But what that means when you extend your hand first is you're showing confidence. You're showing a subtle, polite, respectful confidence and letting the other person know you're interested in getting to know them. And you always greet with your feet. If you remember nothing else today from this webinar, and I certainly hope you do, I want you to remember that you always stand up for every introduction. You never shake someone's hand or look up and say hello to someone without standing up when possible. So you want to stand up, say hello, make eye contact, extend your hand for a firm handshake, Repeat your name first and last. So I am never just Diane. I'm Diane Gotsman. Hello, I'm Diane Gotsman. Even if they don't remember it, it sounds more it sounds more friendly. It sounds more professional because it's also all about your tone of voice. So you're going to stand up. You're going to extend your hand. You're going to say your name. But one of the most important things you are going to do besides this little recipe 
is you are going to open your mouth. And what I mean by that is you're going to smile and you're going to part your lips. And I know that sounds robotic, you know, just listening to me say it. But when you smile and when other people smile, if you do a little experiment, you can look around the room or look around to people who are talking to you and you can tell whether someone is genuinely comfortable based on the way they smile. So an authentic smile, a comfortable smile, is one where you part your lips, you can see your teeth, and you smile. It includes your cheek muscles, it includes your eyes. So a true smile involves your teeth. That's the best way to remember it. And if someone might be saying right now, well, that's not how I smile. That's not my authentic smile. It's probably with that tone of voice as well. And that tone of voice says, I'm guarded. So when we were babies, we whether we were a, whether you're a sighted baby or a baby that cannot see, they didn't see anybody to see how other people smiled. They smiled naturally by just giving us this big gummy smile. So that's what we want to come back to, an authentic smile that you open your mouth and you show some teeth. I don't even care if you don't have any front teeth. You are much more attractive when you smile and part your lips. So you're going to stand up, you're going to smile, you're going to make eye contact 40 to 60% of the time. You're going to extend your hand and you're going to say your name first and last. And once they say your name, hello, Diane, it's nice to see you or nice to meet you, you use their name in conversation. So that's the proper introduction. And then you're going to start to work the room. In other words, you're not going to stick closely by one person the entire night. You're going to talk to them for a few minutes, seven to ten minutes. You're going to uh, make engaging conversation because, remember, you're the, you're the cross between the introvert and the extrovert. You've done your homework. You've read um, online what's happening in the world that's positive, And you are making conversation based on that. And certainly, before you leave the party, sometime in that period of time, you want to thank the party organizers. You want to thank the host. So when you arrive, you're going to greet the host. If the host is not around, you want to say hello. And then you want to make sure that you say goodbye at the end. You never want to skip out of a party without saying goodbye. You know, so often we say, okay, let's We've been here 20 minutes. Let's get out of here. Let's go someplace. <laughs> Let's go to the next party. But they are going to notice. So you always want to thank your host. And if for whatever reason they offer name tags, because you're not just going to the holiday office party. You're going to your clients' parties. You're going to your friends' parties. You're going to different functions for the holidays. If they offer name tags, wear it. Don't just stick it in your purse. Don't put it on your thigh. Don't wear it on your, on your purse or on your wrist. It goes on the right shoulder to follow the line of sight of a handshake. I didn't so know it that. Goes, <laughs> yes, it goes on the right-hand side. There's going to be a disconnect. If you have it on the left side, the eyes are going to dart over. And while they may, you may have never met them before, but that disconnect, that dart, when you have to remember their name and look across, is somewhat of an insult. You know, it's kind of that pause where you say, hmm, okay, they didn't remember. And by the way, if you don't remember someone's name, so what we tend to do when we don't remember someone's name and we see them, we say, hey, you. You know, and we have this silly smile on our face that, that says, I have no idea who you are. So instead of just pretending or avoiding them and walking the other way, just own it. Just say, okay, I know we have met before. Please remind me of your name. I'm going, I'm going blank. You know, whatever it is that you would say authentically to own it, just say, please remind me. And when they say, yes, uh, Jane Smith, you would say, yes, Jane, of course. All right, yes, yes. I'm going to commit that to memory. And guess what? You'll probably forget again because the reality is we do forget we're only human. So it's far better to ask and show interest than to pretend that you know and they can tell. They know when somebody can't remember their name. So 
Now, Diane, with the holiday if, uh-huh. Oh, we have one Go question ahead. here. Um, what if somebody has a difficult to pronounce name or you're you know, meeting someone and you can't really hear because it's a loud party? Is, how do you get out of that situation? <laughs> So that's why name tags are so important. They are really so useful because we can look at that name tag, and that helps us. If you have a difficult name, if you're listening and you have a difficult name, you have to remember two things. When you say your name, and again, that's why you say your first and last name, and you say the last name louder than the first, because what we tend to do is drop the last name lower in volume. Say it, spell it on your name tag phonetically, so they can, they can see it visually, so they're hearing it, they're seeing it, and you can say, I know my name sounds like, so give them some kind of rhyme. So for example, um, and, and this is not a difficult name, but my name is Diane, and people call me Diana. So let's say mm-hmm. that person then says, oh, it's great to meet you, Diana. Well, what do we do here? Do I, you know, what, what we think is, do I embarrass this person? I don't want to embarrass them. But if you just say it's Diane with an E, you know, with a, with a pleasant tone of voice rather than it's Diane with an E, not an A. You know, it's all about your delivery. So in answer to your question is you write it phonetically on your name tag. You say it clearly. And if, if you can get some kind of memory tool, something that it rhymes with, or you can say it's a, it's a hard G instead of a soft G, you know, something that they can grab onto, that's always very helpful. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So with the office party, part of the fun of any party for many people is that open bar. (laughs) Because generally there is an open bar. And while it's perfectly fine to drink, I am not going to tell you you should not drink. But I am going to tell you professionally that you really should monitor your liquor. It's I don't care who is drinking around you and how crazy they are getting, and that could include your supervisor and your boss. You are responsible for your own reputation. So it, what it says about you is you have good judgment, poor judgment. You can hold your liquor. You can't hold your liquor. You know, we all make these assessments based on what we see. So... What we generally do as a guest at any party is we drink one to two drinks the first hour and then a drink thereafter. That's just, that's what a host would count on when they're buying liquor. You know, one to two drinks the first hour um, and then one drink thereafter. If you're at an office party and you're there for multiple hours, that may be too much for you. So you need to back up and you can certainly switch over to, you know, to some kind of pretty water, seltzer, tonic, whatever you would drink. And, I am not, again, I'm not telling you not to drink, but there is a study, and it was published in 2013, and it was called the Imbibing Idiot Bias. And it was these uh, these researchers from the University of Michigan and Penn Swarton School did did this study, and they found that merely holding a drink, just holding a drink, can make you seem less intelligent when someone is looking at you. And I, the study went on to to say that even if you were the boss and you were paying for it, it's still that person, whoever the boss was, still gay, had the impression that you were less intelligent. You know, thus the imbibing idiot bias. That's not my that's not my title. That's theirs. So drinking in itself is not negative, but over imbibing clearly. You know, we know that liquor reduces inhibitions. We we know that we talk too much when we drink. We get too happy. We slur our words. Basically, we lose control physically and by reputation. So you run the risk of saying something that you may not say otherwise, and it's really difficult to take something back. So, again, loose lips sink ships. So I think that (laughs) you drink, you drink responsibly, and if you don't drink at all, because one of the most commonly asked questions I get from the executives is, well, I don't drink. You know, it would be a particular person who doesn't drink and feels pressured to drink. And in that case, you don't, you don't have to drink. You can carry around a, a soda and, you know, lime in it. You, or you don't even have to pretend you're drinking. You know, you just, 
I think if you are making conversation, if you are networking and mingling, if you're doing all of the right things, nobody really cares. The bottom line is nobody really cares whether you're drinking or not if you are doing everything else right. If they ask you, you can just say, I'm, you know, I'm, tonight I'm, I'm sticking to soda, you know. So just be comfortable with whatever you are doing. Now, the holiday party is not the time to discuss any ongoing projects, any deadlines, anyone's salary. Certainly, you don't want to talk about what anybody else is making. And definitely, you don't ask for a raise at the holiday party. Do not corner your boss and ask for a raise because that is going to set you up um, for a negative impression. So you want to avoid volatile topics. You steer clear of politics, even though how do you do that? It's all over the news. Uh, you want to steer clear from sensitive subjects. You want to avoid salary talk, as we just talked about. And by the way, if you look at the screenshot, you want to keep your hands off your coworkers and anybody else that, that you are with. You know, in the professional world, the handshake is the most appropriate greeting. So just remember that. You know, if, if you're not sure enough, somebody comes to you with extended arms for a hug, certainly you wouldn't want to stick a hand in their stomach because that would be insulting. <laughs> but there is a protocol to a hug. You know, when I do these sessions, these corporate sessions, I go in and we'll maybe do a two-hour session, let's say. We could spend 45 to an hour, 45 minutes to an hour on hugs and hugs alone. There are so many questions about that uncomfortable gesture. So what I say, and this is the best way to, to remember it, is if someone is extending their arms for a hug, and certainly you don't want to, and this is, let's say this is your a, a client, and you would lean in and just hug shoulder to shoulder. You know, a very, a very, and I'm not encouraging it. I'm not telling you that you should hug first, shake second. You should always shake first. But if you do go in for a hug, if somebody goes in to hug you, just shoulder to shoulder and that's it. You know, not long, not lingering, and that is it. So there are several different things you can do when you are caught in an uncomfortable situation. Let's say somebody's talking about politics that you, do, you may or may not agree with, religion, uh, somebody's divorce, gossip. So what you're going to do is you have several options. If, and, and this is not an option for gossip, but this is an option for most other things. You can listen respectfully and remain civil if someone is espousing their political views. In other words, it might be your boss and you absolutely don't agree with what, she is he or, what he or she is saying. But you don't have to get into a big debate. And you certainly don't have to jump in and convince them that they are wrong. You know, truly, we never really know a person's true feelings about a hot topic. They can be telling you one thing, and you can be agreeing, and they might be thinking, okay, commit this to memory. So you can also attempt to change the subject. And by the way, it does not matter if they know you're doing it. You are politely showing them where you stand on the conversation. So if they continue on and on, you can even say, you know, let's, let's table this and let's talk about something more pleasant or something that's not going to get you so excited, your, you know, your head's about to blow off, it's bright red, you wouldn't say that. But, you know, you can let them know that you're not comfortable with that topic just by changing the subject. And if it's gossip, I just, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you want to jump out of that conversation. You can say, hey, guys, it's a holiday party. I want to keep it light. Because even if you're not part of the conversation, if you are a part of that group that is having the conversation and it gets overheard, you are part of that group. You know, the smirking, the laughing, even though it's not you, you become part of it. So gossip is divisive. It's all, you know, volatile topics in general are divisive, but you want to remove yourself. So you can say, I'm going to grab another plate of pasta. I'm going to go get another drink. There's somebody I need to talk to and just remove yourself from that conversation. But here's a warning. If you say, I'm going to the bar, or I'm going to get seconds at the buffet, one or more of those people might say, well, I'm going to go with you. So you have to be careful of the excuse you use. So just say, if you'd please excuse me, um, I see someone I need to chat with, 
Um, I'll catch up with you later. And then you're gone. And by the way, when you exit a conversation, you always close the conversation and open the conversation the same way, which means that it's going to be a handshake. You're going to shake hands hello if you haven't seen these people in a while. Certainly if you just work, if you just left the office with them you know, 30 minutes ago, this is different. But when you're meeting people you haven't seen for a while, you'd say, you'd say hello with your handshake. And when you close and leave, you shake hands again. So that opens it and it closes it. And the bottom line to the volatile topics, again, is it's not your job to change someone's mind. You just, it's your job to enjoy the party and be on your best behavior. So an awkward moment that often happens, not always at a holiday party, but during the holidays in general is gift giving. Gift giving is one of those uh, awkward moments, especially when you don't have something to give back to them. Or there are so many questions that involve gift giving. How much do I spend? Do I have to gift my boss? What do I do? So I think taking time to express gratitude is really important. The protocol of gifting your boss is that you don't have to. But the reality is you're probably going to want to. You're going to want to show, especially if you work with them, you know, day to day, shoulder to shoulder, you're going to want to give them something that is small but grateful, you know, heartfelt, which I think the best thing to do is to get together with your team, get together with your employee, you know, other employees and give him or her a group gift. But certainly you don't want to come across as a brown noser. So you don't want to show up with something over the top because it just makes you look not very authentic. So you want to be modest. But I think that participation is the key. If you have some kind of gift exchange at the office, if you have a secret Santa, if you have a secret elf, if there is something going on at your office, you don't want to be viewed as the Grinch. So just, just roll with it out of fun. You know, if you're wanting to give your colleague a gift, a, a real gift, a present, and it's a colleague. But you're not bringing gifts to everyone at the office. Gift away from the office. So give it to them away from your office so you don't run the risk of hurting other people's feelings. I think that's really important. And remember, the holidays is a perfect opportunity to say thank you to, to people who support you all year round. So that could be, that could be the the person that brings your mail. That could be the valet. That could be somebody that, you know, comes in and out on a day-to-day -day basis that you want to remember. So, and it doesn't have to be something over the top. It can be a, you know, a small gift card to a, a deli that they like. It can be to a coffee shop if you know that they love a certain kind of coffee. But when you are gifting to a client, you need to check the gift giving policy first because some companies don't allow their employees to accept gifts. So it puts them in an uncomfortable situation because then they have to tell you, gosh, I can't accept it. So before you send out a wine basket or a fruit tray or whatever you're going to be giving that, that this coming season, call and just ask what their gift giving policy is. And don't be offended if they tell you, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't accept it. That's why it's better to know in advance. Just don't go overboard. People know when you're trying to, for lack of a better word, suck up. You know, and you want to avoid any gifts that have your logos plastered at all, all over it. Don't include a business card in your holiday card. It can be in the signature line, but you don't want to look like you're marketing. Now, certainly, if you give a gift, you definitely want to use a gift tag. And then you don't want to forget extraordinary acts of kindness because this is the perfect time to remember your mentor or a colleague that you don't even see very often who went out of their way to help you with a particular project over the year. So again, not over the top, it can be a bag of chocolate, it can be some, you know, bean, coffee beans, something small that just shows that you're acknowledging their thoughtfulness. And you know, I'm often asked what kind of gifts to give, you know, when it's some kind of uh, office gift. And I think we received a lot of questions wrong. about that. 
You did. You did. Okay. Well, yes. I think you can't go wrong with technology. And, you know, you can go from one end of the spectrum to the other in terms of price point. But, you know, you can – those chargers or a little leather pouch to keep your chargers in or a passport holder is not technology, but it's, you know, it's something about travel or those zip pouches that they can keep for change. Certainly you can do a wine opener if you know they like wine. Um, there's so many smaller gifts that you can find that don't in, include a big price tag, but something that shows that you are thinking specifically of them. Now, if you know, you know, and this is getting a little late in the day, but if you know so, that somebody likes something and you want to put their monogram on it, this is the time to do it. So let's say it's luggage tags, or it might be a mug, or it could be, you know, it, the, the list is endless. You know, uh, I like socially, not corporately, but socially, because corporate and social overlap. And the value of today's webinar is everything we're talking about corporately, you can use socially. And I like cocktail napkins. And I think they're really pretty gifts. They make nice gifts, nice presentations. And you can even give those to someone that is in a corporate environment that they could use for their coffee cups. They could, it just has that extra level of elevation. And then what do you do if somebody shows up with something for you and you don't have anything for them? So that's an awkward moment. That's one of the most and dreaded situations. <laughs> It, it is. It is. And what we tend to do is we start making excuses and we start, we just start blubbering and everything, you know, we start going dark because they know we don't have anything for them. It is not in our car and it needs to be wrapped or I left it at <laughs> home. You know, those are all just excuses. So all you do is smile, show those teeth, smile genuinely and say thank you. It's the correct response for a coworker. It's the correct response for a friend or a neighbor. When someone presents something to you, just say, thank you so much. This is so thoughtful of you. And then you decide, am I going to get them something? Will I get them something after the new year? Maybe I'll take them to lunch. You, a gift is not an obligation. You do not have to give them a gift because they gave you a gift. And you get to decide, you know, based on your relationship. But if you didn't give them a gift to begin with, probably you're not, if this isn't your closest relationship. But certainly um, that's up to you to decide what you want to do. Just don't make excuses. Just smile and say thank you. So there are a few tips on tipping I'm going to go over. There's, uh, I, could, I mean, you can tell I can talk about this topic for about three days and not, <laughs> not breathe or blink. But tipping is a one of, of the information. Most there's so much, but there is, tipping is one of the most commonly asked questions. You know, who do I have to tip? When do I tip? And I just think that it's, poor, it's important to remember those that you see on a regular basis. So you talk to your manager to see if the company is going to cover a gratuity for people like those valets I talked about or the delivery drivers or the maintenance crew, a doorman, somebody that meant something to you. And if they aren't going to cover it. You're going to decide whether you want to do it or not. And, you know, I have a whole list, a whole tipping guide on my website that you can go to, and we can offer it, Kim, later. So I think that one of the things that we absolutely want to – I want to roll through because I know we have questions, but you can't overlook at that holiday meal because that is one of the most uncomfortable situations to be in is when you sit in front of a plate of food and you don't know what to do. It's it's <laughs> The most dreaded uh, engagement when you're on a first date, second interviews are conducted over a meal because they want to see how you behave socially. So I'm going to give us a few tips today. And again, most of it, all of this, all of this and more you can find on the website. But you need to know where to place your napkin. Your napkin goes straight on your lap with a fold facing your belly button. And just remember that the fold is facing your waist. You're going to cut one bite of food at a time. You're not going to chop up all your food, just like your mom did for you when you were five. You cut one bite at a time, put one piece of, you know, an item of food in your mouth at a time. You wait for the food to cool. You don't blow on it. If you're, if you're sipping soup and it's hot, take a drink of liquid. Don't let, throw it back into the soup bowl. You know, spit it back out in the soup bowl. I've seen that happen over and over. You don't want to gesture with your utensils. Salt and pepper 
are passed together, think of them as a couple. Somebody asks for salt, pass the salt and pepper. And you pass everything clockwise. So just remember when you sit at the table, if you would make a B with your le a B and a D, so a D with your left hand and a B with your right, that means you take your index finger and thumb and you make a circle and the rest of your fingers, your hand goes straight, your fingers on that hand go straight up. You're going to make a B, right hand, D, left. D is for your drink, and B is for your bread. So your drink is always on the left, and your B is on the right. And you spoon away from the body when you're eating your soup. And guys, you keep your ties down, and then you're just going to cut one piece at a time. So, you know, one piece of food at a time that we talked about. So... Basically, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but you need to know how that table is set. So your B, your bread plate, is on the left. Your D, your drinks, are all on the right, and you're going to eat from the outside in. Your glassware is positioned in the order that you're going to drink it. And if you're setting your own table, you want to make sure your centerpiece is low enough that you can see over the other person. That is just Right there, what we just talked about is about the <laughs> is is the very least you should know. But it's so interesting, and once you master some of these skills, you don't have the deer in the headlights look. You are able to spend time with that other person in conversation, so you're not worried about what you look like and and what you are doing wrong. And if you see somebody else doing something that that may not be correct by the letter of etiquette, the protocol rule. You never, never, never criticize them or correct them because the minute you criticize someone or correct them, you lose your power because all of this is about you and making other people feel comfortable to be around you. It's really about you being the best you you can be authentically so you can show courtesy and kindness to the other person because that's what builds relationships and that's what gets you hired, referred, oh, your repeat business. It's all about building relationships. There's only one statistic I use corporately and it's this study done by Harvard, Carnegie and the Stanford Foundation and they found that 85% of your job success is based on your ability to put others at ease. And that's what this is all about today. Oh, I love that statistic, and it's so true. Absolutely. So that um, well, is my book. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so yeah, – um, Oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, the, on, on the screen is my book, Modern Etiquette for a Better Life. And that and everything we've talked about and much more is in there, but we have some great questions coming up I'm looking forward to. Yes, we do, and that's what I was just going to say. Um, you covered so much great information, and I know we had to speed through it a little bit because um, we're limited on time today, but um, if you're looking for more etiquette information, please check out Diane's book, and please send in your questions. We have a ton of them already, and keep sending them our way. Um, and before we start answering them, I have the – offer that I always give, um, give the gift of Forbes this holiday season. Um, each gift subscription is just $20 for a, for a full year of Forbes. Simply go to www.forbesmagazine.com slash holiday and fill out the form. And we're getting in some great questions. Um, this one kind of sticks out. Um, somebody decorated their desk for the holidays, but nobody else in the office did. Does this reflect on them negatively? Should they take it down? Well, I w the first question that comes to mind is, I'm wondering why no one else did. I don't know if there is a policy that this person doesn't know about. So if there is, certainly, um, if they're the person asking, are they the ones who decorated their desk? Yeah, I think she yes, or they decorated their desk. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they they have to take it down. They can be cheerful if they're over the top. I think it's probably <laughs> too much. I'm going to say if if they're feeling like it's too much, it's probably too much. I think you should be tasteful within the office. But but clearly the corporate culture does not decorate. So you don't while you want to be festive and you might put something out a an item or two. If they are blinged out with, you know, lights and 
trees that are circling and, you know, things that are making noise, I certainly think twice about it and, and take it down. And, and again, it's just all about knowing what the corporate culture is and, and staying true to that corporate culture. It's not to say that you should not have a personality, but you don't want to do something that goes against the grain. I think that's excellent advice. Um, I am thinking about putting up a holiday screensaver on my desk, and I think that might be a safe bet. <laughs> um, I like that. I like that. <laughs> Um, so somebody doesn't celebrate Christmas, what's the best way to handle when others wish them a Merry Christmas? Say thank you. Thank you so much. It's What they're doing is they're extending a gesture, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. a friendly gesture. Now, in a perfect world, everyone that's listening, I would suggest you say happy holidays. And And if that particular person doesn't celebrate the holidays, Okay. I mean, we could just go on and on. So you just say thanks so much. That's it. You know, there are some religions that don't that don't practice anything. But I think that right. it's it, you go counter. It's counterintuitive to then start a debate. So you just say thanks so much. Great advice. Um, another person is a little worried about what photos from the holiday party might show up on social media. Is there a way to ask others to keep them offline? There's so much I want to say about this. We don't have time. <laughs> so oh. the first thing I want to say is the holiday party, there should not be anything that you're worried about posting on social media because you are acting totally appropriate. That's what I'm anticipating yeah. everyone is going to do. However, the reality is when we get around our friends and we start having a little too much fun, and that's perfectly fine. That's fine to to let your hair down. But I think friends don't post other friends in awkward situations. We should never post anything that is not approved by someone else first. So, but there is no guarantee of that. So we have to know that there, we always run the risk. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, I have a private page, so no one's going to see what I, I'm going to post something, but no one else will see it. I think you need to think again because anything can be seen. Anything can be shared. It can be, you know, it can be screen saved. There's all kinds of ways for people to see what's on somebody else's page. So I think err on the side of caution if you are at the party, socially and professionally, but certainly please don't post anything that someone else uh, would not approve of. And you should, best case scenario, always ask. I know my friends and I, it's like a courtesy delete. Okay, let me see it before you post it because I don't want it going up unless I approve it first. And that's what friends do. <laughs> you need to make sure your hair looks nice, your makeup's not smudged. And all the you know, we all know that everything that's up on social media has either been edited or if it's on our websites or, I mean, this includes me. Everything has been fine-tuned, not so much Photoshopped, but you pick the best photos. So, of you course. know, the one photo that up might be, you know, one out of a hundred. So I think that we really need to be um, polite and courteous and respectful of our friends and our family and certainly in our professional setting. Absolutely. Um, speaking of the holiday party, if you're invited to a corporate holiday party, are you obligated to attend? A lot of people have wanted to know the answer to this. Yes, you are. That's what I was referring to by mandatory fun. Um, <laughs> yes, and I, you know, I say this with a sigh because I understand. But truly, when you are invited to your office party, that is one of those events throughout the year that you should not miss. That says something about you, unless you planned seven months ago a trip, you know, overseas, you can't change the flight, it, you know, barring any extenuating circumstances that could not be changed, you want to go to the, mm -hmm. the holiday party and you want to put your best foot forward. So speaking of best foot forward, say you find yourself grounded by some non-corporate holiday party talk that someone's talking politics, it's making you uncomfortable. How do you gracefully pull yourself away from that? Um, I know you sort of mentioned this in the presentation. You say, oh, I need to get another drink or I need to talk to this person, but um, say it's just really inappropriate um, and you need to 
get away as soon as possible. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for those situations? So I say you just excuse yourself. You just get away. You don't have to apologize or feel badly because you're removing yourself from a conversation that you don't want to be in. You do it politely, uh, but you just say, listen, if you excuse me, I've got something, I've got somebody else I, I'd like to chat with, so I'll, I'll see you later, you know, I'll catch up with you later. You don't have to be in that conversation. Okay. Now, if you're um, stuck at a table with them, that's a different story. So you do the best you can. The host is watching you. People know and understand what's going on. You you just, it, you know, this doesn't sound like it's a very uh, strong answer, but sometimes we do the best we can for that moment. And then you go up mm -hmm. later to your boss and say, listen, I apologize. I, you know, I was at, I, I was at the other end of the table, and I, I excused myself a little bit earlier because it was kind of an uncomfortable conversation I didn't want to be a part of. Because if they're slanderous, if they are um, really saying some things that they should not, you don't want to be part of that conversation. And you tell them, you know, this is an appropriate conversation. It's certainly, an, it's certainly uncomfortable for me, so let's change the subject. You have to be proactive. Etiquette is not always about being nice. You know, nice is free. <laughs> Sometimes we have to be more assertive when necessary, but but always in the vein of professional and in you know doing the best we can do. Along those lines, um, here's a good question: How can you look out for a work friend who, in the past, has maybe drank too much at a party, um, and you're worried about being associated with them? So I would say. I'm going to use uh, I'm going to use Lucy as an example. You know, Lucy, I really respect you. We are good friends, but I have to tell you that I'm concerned because when we get in these social environments, you you over you get drunk. You overdrink. I mean, you know, you're not going to sugarcoat it. And I want to protect your reputation. I want to keep you safe. So I really I'm coming to you as a friend and telling you I'm concerned. You know, you can just tell if you're a close friend, you want to friends tell friends when they care about them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're worried about being associated with her, you can say, "I, I, you know, it's judgment by association." So, I'm, I am cautious because of you, and I'm also careful with my reputation. This job means a lot to me. So, I appreciate, I appreciate you helping yourself out and me. And certainly, you don't want to let her or him, whoever it is, you know, get in the car behind the wheel. So you want to be responsible, whatever that takes. And we all know what that means just based on that situation. Um, here's a good question. How long do you need to stay at the holiday party? You know, you know, this kind of pertains to me too. I am not a partier. I, I tend to want to go, you know, talk with a couple people. Right. How early is too early to leave a party? Well, there is not a set <laughs> time. Let me say that. I can't say to you 13 minutes and 27 <laughs> seconds, although, gosh, that would be nice. But I do that think nice. that you stay long enough. I know. I do think that you stay long enough to meet, um, to to talk to, to all of, you know, depending on how large this party is. I mean, there are some parties that have 300 people. There are some that have 20. So um, right. you want to stay long enough that you have made an impact. You might have gone through the buffet line, even if you didn't eat. You Even if you don't want to eat, Go through and just get something. You know, get something so you don't look like you're just sitting there with your arms crossed. And try and let the party start to un I don't want to use the word unravel, but basically, you know, it starts to wind down. I don't want you right. to leave so early that you're noticed. You don't want to be the first to leave and you don't want to be the last. That's the best thing I can say to you. That's because great advice. Because if so. you're walking around with your keys, you, you look a little anxious. <laughs> Um, and you know, some, I've been people, there. I wanted to leave those parties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, some people are saying, you know, they're a little introverted. They're a little nervous. Um, you gave some great tips about, you know, introducing yourself. You extend your hand. You say your name. Um, what are some safe topics to bring up when you're, you know, a little so nervous I, about meeting new people at the holiday party? Sure. I want you to remember the 60-40 rule. So you let them talk 60%. You listen. You ask questions based on what they're saying. So you're going to come up with some topics because you're going to have them. You know, remember I said you have to prepare in advance. 
So you're going to have mm-hmm. questions ready. You're going to ask them how long they've been with the company. Where did you come from before? What have you? What would you say would be one of the most important things that you've learned so far since you've cut? Not necessarily about the company, but since you've since you've moved to the city. What What do you find most intriguing? You know, ask. It doesn't all have to be about work. You know, what museums do you like to visit? Um, what do you think about uh, the new, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the new ice skating rink they just built? Have you taken your kids, if they have kids? So, and then listen to them and listen to what they say. And based on what they say, you ask questions. Now, when they ask you what you do or where you're from or whatever they ask you, you want to respond with a little bit more than they gave you because you want to give some open-ended answers. So it's a give and take. You're not just drilling them with questions and then answering their question and shutting down. So by nature, I'm an introvert, but I know that to, to navigate life, I have to engage, especially with what I do. So I, we all, you know, whether you're, in, so in other words, introverts don't have an excuse. We have to become, it's our job to be interesting. Now for the extrovert, it's their job to pull it back a notch because they tend to want to talk about themselves more than they want to hear about that other person. So, again, we have to find that balance between too little and too much, introvert, extrovert. And we can do it because it takes time and effort to make it look seamless. Absolutely. Um, Here's one more question about the holiday party, and then I want to shift gears after this one. Um, Is the holiday party a good time to introduce yourself to company executives you haven't met yet? Do you recommend that I go up to Mr. Forbes and introduce myself? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I don't recommend you go up to Mr. Forbes and hand him your business card or ask for a race. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's happened. But I do recommend you going up, extending your hand, saying hello, telling him, and you know, telling your boss, whoever that is, or, or company execs, how much you enjoy working uh, for the company. Don't monopolize their time. You're only there to say hello, speak a few minutes, and move on. You don't want to have them captive audience so they can't mix and mingle themselves. But, yes, right. this is the perfect time. <laughs> This is Um, the time for you to sign with your five-star training. (laughs) Perfect. Um, So we do have a lot of questions about gift giving. Um, Do you have any good gift suggestions for your mentor or for your mentee? So there are just so many things, but they may not be applicable based on who they are. So what I might say, you know, what I I would tend to say something that they could use at their desk. They may not have a desk. They may, so they have to, if it's their mentor or mentee, they know them. They know their likes. Mm -hmm. They know what they enjoy. So I think that it has to be something that is personal, but not too personal. In other words, it can be something they enjoy, but not something that would make them feel uncomfortable. You know, not clothing, not uh, not not a not something that would make them feel like this is too much. But it could be a it could be something again back to that technology. But I say that all the time. It could be some earbuds. It could be depending on how much you want to spend. Some people have a bigger budget than other people. Um, mm-hmm. It could be a pen. It could be you know I don't like coffee mugs. I don't like to say. I do like coffee mugs. I don't like to suggest coffee mugs because when people don't know what to give, they give coffee mugs, candles, and body lotion. Do not give body <laughs> lotion. That's a no. A coffee mug uh, is just going to get lost. And candles, you know, it's always the wrong scent. So I think that you need right. to think creatively. If you know that they like, if, if they're a cook, if you know that they happen to like cooking, you might get them some kind of special olive oil or some wooden spoons, or and don't worry whether they're going to like it or not. You know, they may not use wooden spoons. They may want something else. But it's the thought. It's the gift, you know, and, and the time that you spent with that gift that's going to count. It is it is what your mom says. It is the thought that counts. <laughs> um, is there an appropriate amount of money we should be spending on these gifts? Obviously, everyone has a different budget, but say um, – right. 
your cubicle mate or your boss, you don't want to spend too much because you don't want to look like you're you know, showing off sure. or anything, but you also don't want to give something that's too inexpensive. So if you're giving a gift to your colleague or even your boss, you know, your boss, a little different, back to I'd suggest you go in as a group or give them some, give your boss something like, uh, something homemade, like muffins or your favorite chocolate fudge or I something like that, that you know he like and bring enough for the team, bring enough to put in the kitchen and give them some to take home. You know, that's a safe bet. So it's not a monetary gift. It's more of something that is something that you would give everyone. But for a colleague, if you're giving something to a colleague because they're a colleague who helps you, certainly let's talk about your assistant. Your assistant is different. That's called a bonus. And so, you know, it could be anything from 50 to 500. It depends on your company, and it depends on what your company is going to also offer. Um, it, it depends on the company that you work for, their corporate policy, and how much they're going to give. But if you're giving something to your colleague who is a friend, if you're, going to, if you're going to give them something that's social, give it away from the office. And it could be $25, $40. It's just hard to guess, you know, because everybody has a different budget and a different relationship. But I think you're pretty okay. safe within the 25 to 45 range. Okay. Um, and some people and may think that's you... really high and some people may think that's really low. And it is, depending. So, you know, that's just a right. sliding scale. Um, would you recommend that you write a thank you note to, for every gift you receive from a colleague? From a colleague? If you work in the office with a colleague and you all are exchanging gifts, you're saying thank you there, let's say, at the holiday party. I know that's not what you asked, but that's how usually you exchange gifts. It's a gift exchange. Mm -hmm. And so you say thank you. Usually they're fun gifts. Everybody, sometimes they get to swap the gifts afterwards. Now, if somebody gives you something really heartfelt, really sentimental. Let's say somebody, let's say this happened last year with a one of my clients. His mom passed away and they the the team came together and gave him something very heartfelt that had to do with his mom. Certainly you would send that thank you note out to each one of them and thank you, you know, and and thank them for the thought. You never can go wrong with a thank you note. That's the bottom line. So when in doubt, if you want to do it, do it. And thank you notes if they, handwritten thank you notes are not outdated. They're still very much in style because people remember them. Um, I think, let's see, um, let's have one more question. I don't want to um, have to take too much of your time. Um, someone likes to mail Christmas cards and they want to share a few with colleagues. Are they able to politely ask their home address or can they only deliver them at work? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a tough one. If it's a colleague, and they do, I know, if it's a colleague and they don't have a personal relationship with that colleague, I would ask, why do you want to send them a Christmas card with all of the kids and the pets and the year of, you know, that, so I think that you're careful with who you send what to, and if you want to place one on their desk, place it on their desk. But if you place one on their desk, you need to place it on everybody's desk. So it's one of those questions that's kind of slippery because, you know, don't ask your boss for his home address. You know, and, and again, they may not want, they may or may not want to share their address as a colleague. They may want to keep it friendly but professional. So I think that holiday greeting cards that have all of your stuff, you know, what, what your kid's soccer score is and, you know, how many swim classes your, you know, your daughter took. And I think that stays social. That stays with family and friends. And if you give to one, you um, need to give to all. So there might be, you, you might put it, give, hand it to them. At worst case scenario, or best case scenario, hand it to them. Because I want you to see my kids here. I want you to see my family. So I thought I'd give you one of my cards that I'm sending. You know, don't leave it out for everybody to see. If nobody else is getting one. Right. Well, those are such great questions. I wish we could just do this all day. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Diane, for answering all of our questions and for all this great advice. I just feel like you're such a wealth of knowledge about everything etiquette. Um, so thank you again oh, for thanks. joining us. Thank um, you. I thank you. Last... And I, all, you, 
All you have to do is Google the topic and my name, and you will find more than you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> we will. Um, and I one last thing, if you have thank you everyone for joining us today. It's, this has been a great webinar. Um, if you have any questions that didn't get answered or you have additional questions about career, money, or life balance, please send them to us through the survey at the end of the webinar. Or you could email them to us at askbankable at Forbes.com. Or you could follow us on Twitter. We have a new Twitter account. And you can tweet your questions using hashtag AskBankable. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Diane. And everyone have a happy Thanks. holiday.